Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Unlocked, where we talk about unlocking the potential of you, the people you work with, and the people you do life with. At the time of this recording, I'm offering all of you, yes, my lovely listeners, a free 15-minute communication coaching call. You come with some kind of communication problem, and I give you a solution. My calendar link is in the show notes, so check that out. Today, Marcel Schwantes is joining us on the show to talk to us about love. Yeah, that love stuff. And we're going to talk about that in a way that applies to servant leadership, but why it, is, why it matters and why it is taking hold on our workplace culture and on the desires of our people now versus the way it was before, maybe pre-COVID or even decades earlier. And why we should pay attention to this whole topic. Why should it even matter? And why are other authors and other people talking about this so much? It's something we should pay attention to. Marcel is a pretty heavy hitter in this area. Uh, he's a speaker, he's a coach, and he is an Inc. Magazine contributor um, contributing, contributing editor. He's been, uh, featured in time business insider, fast company, the New York daily news, CNBC, Forbes, Chicago tribune, and a lot of other global outlets. He has his own show called love in action podcast. You can search for that. It's heard in over 160 countries. He's had some brilliant people on this show. Um, Ken Blanchard, anybody, uh, Whitney Johnson. Hello, Marshall Goldsmith. Stephen M.R. Covey, John Cousins, and other like there, there's some pretty heavy hitters that have been on this show. Um, Marcel has some clout, I guess you could say. He knows what he knows, and he's learned from the mastermind the minds of those people, and he's now trying to share that with the world in his own way. So this is gonna be part of how he does that, is on my show, and I'm grateful that he was here. Here we come, Marcel. Greetings, Marcel. It's so good to have you. Good to be here. So we are going to talk about some, you know, like people will say this is a little bit touchy feely for me in the leadership space, you know? So uh, we're going to talk about the whole love word a bit, <laughs> I think here. And I'm excited to talk about it because uh, I love having interesting guests on that talk about things I don't talk about very often. I'm, I'm, of course, we should love some people, but you know, the topic of love and leadership, right? A little bit, a little bit different. So, tell me, tell me about the premise of that. Where did that come from? Why are you talking about it in conjunction with leadership? And what are you doing with that? Yeah, wow, um, that's a great, great rabbit hole to go down on. And then we're gonna like once we go down the rabbit hole, there's gonna be about five or six different rabbit holes from there. But I think the starting point is to the definitions, right? I mean, we're, we're, we hear the word love, we throw, throw it around, around loosely and we hear songs on the radio, right? About love. And a lot of that speaks to the, the romantic kind of love, sexual love. I mean, we're talking, we're so far away from that right now. Um, so yeah, the word love is, is very squishy, but we're actually finding it entering the business lexicon in the last maybe three to five years, uh, and even more so after the pandemic. And, and so when we speak of love, we're talking about love the verb, not love the feeling or the emotion of love. So if you want to, you know, go back to your, remember your Greek high school classes. I don't know if, you know, you took your Greek maybe in college. There I are took zero Greek, Mark. No <laughs> zero. Greek. No okay. Greek. Well, the Greeks had, they, they defined love in several ways. And the one that really applies to uh, leadership in the workplace is agape love. So agape love basically states that um, it's you, you love by elevating the other person by putting the needs of somebody ahead of your own. Um, and so in the leadership realm, we can see how that plays a part and um, how the best leaders operate, right? They meet the needs of others. I mean, if you want to borrow that from servant leadership, there's a lot of love going on in the servant leadership. Uh, 
in in the, the whole you know that whole philosophy of of leading right so it's building someone up it's developing them it's um providing for their needs and setting them up for success because at the end of the day this isn't just touchy feely stuff we actually have to have the hard side of leadership right we want, we need to have results we need to have uh uh, excellence and goals need to be met. And so, but we do that. We love other people well and set them up for success so that they perform at a high level. And then you have all of the other benefits of leading with love for the other person and for yourself, right? That are more mental health and well being related. People feel better about, about coming into work, feel better about um, having a purpose. Uh, and having clear expectations and having meaning in their jobs, right? So they understand how the little stuff leads to the big stuff. It keeps them engaged. And, and then you have leaders that lead with love by providing a safe environment for others to experiment, maybe break stuff and not get in trouble for it because, hey, failing is all part of learning and we grow by failing forward. So that's kind of, if you want that as sort of a, maybe a little bit of a framework for our discussion uh, about, you know, what do we mean when we say love from a leadership okay. standpoint? So you're talking about this idea of being for people, being, I'm for them, I'm helping them, I'm collaborating, I'm lifting up, I'm, but being for you, I don't have, you know, we're not talking about like, I'm for you. I'm your cheerleader. Ha ha, rah, rah, all that stuff, which is part of being for you, but I'm also helping you do hard stuff and pushing you to do hard stuff because I'm for you. I want you to be a better person. So I'm also going to challenge you yeah. to do that. And so when you messed up, there's going to be the, the, the tough love side of love, if you will. Right. Who's going to provide you with really maybe some hard, um, constructive feedback to get you back on the right track, right? Just like as parents, if you're a parent, you know, your kid messes up, you know, he might get a lecture and, but he, he might under, he, he needs to understand the consequences of his behavior and how to correct that behavior. And it's no different in leadership, right? We don't want the same, the person to be doing the same thing and messing up again. Um, so we allow him the space to make mistakes, but hold them accountable and show the way forward so that the same thing doesn't happen again. And that's tough love. They may, you might have to tell them things they don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. And ultimately, you know, 10 years down the road or whatever, I can look back at that situation, whether it is my parent or whether it was a boss or somebody on my team that said, ah, I didn't like it at the time, but I'm sure glad I went through that. I'm sure glad yeah. that they had that hard talk with me at that exactly. time because it's helped me be who I am today. Exactly. And it, and you might add that it's exactly what I needed at that time to get to where I am now, but you had to get over the hump and that, that caring boss helped you and guided you along the way and, and, and over those humps. Okay. So tell me, tell me this. Um, I mean, you talk about this, you have a podcast, um, that where you talk about this called love in action. So people mm -hmm. can go check that out too. When we talk about love and action, what what's the premise of that? How are you making love, not the verb, but the thing into this idea that that creates action and momentum? Right. So it's caring with impact, right? If you just care and you're you mentioned you'd be a you're a rah rah boss, um, but there are no results at the end of it, at the end of the at the end of the day, or a person isn't changed by your leadership, um, or somebody isn't growing at the pace they should, um, then you're just a cheerleader, right? So we're talking about you have to have love backed with action. And, and the action part is the hard part of love, the tough part of love, holding someone accountable, maybe even holding their feet to the fire when they're low performing, right? Uh, but always never stop caring about the person. Uh, you know, we, we hear about a lot of other squishy 
terms that are more reserved for faith-based communities. Like, let me throw a word at you, Scott, forgiveness. How often do we actually practice forgiveness in the workplace, especially as, as leaders? So what would that look like? That would probably imply that before you drop the hatchet on someone for making a mistake, you want to listen and find out what happened. You know, assume positive intent. Hey, we're all human. We're, we're all going to mess up. And, and so in forgiving someone, you're allowing the space to, for that person to be human and to say, boss, I messed up. And you're saying, don't worry, I mess up too. I'm human just like you. I forgive you. And then moving forward to make sure, again, that the same mistake isn't, you know, isn't made again. But tendency in a lot of top-down command and control structures of, of work is to, uh, you know, act impulsively and, and uh, get rid of the person that may have committed an honest mistake, right? Yeah, I call it uh, moving from critique to curiosity, um, you know, accusing, pointing fingers, blame, accusations, all kinds of things. And instead of backing up and going, huh, what was going on there? Kind right. Of and, being inquisitive. And in perspective, right? We, we have to, there's various things going on in the workplace. You know, a lot of, a lot of businesses there, it's a moving target daily, right? Things are shifting, constantly evolving. It's, it's messy. Business can be messy. And because human nature is involved, it's even messier. So you have to allow for people to uh, to be human and come alongside them. And when they make mistakes, to find out what happened before jumping into conclusion. You know what they say about the word assume, right? Ask you, me, right? So we don't want to go there and this, make the assumption that um, that somebody messed up because they're just you know playing stupid or they are not deserving to be in this job anymore. You want to seek various perspectives, use your emotional intelligence, gather feedback, find out what happened. Maybe it wasn't that person's fault altogether. Maybe some things happened, you know, prior leading up to a mistake being made that perhaps was a process oriented thing or a systems thing, or, you know, the, the person before in the previous role of that person, maybe, left things in, in, in a, in a bad state or somebody inherited, uh, you know, a, a, a bad work environment and, uh, and, you know, you know, things, things just kind of went South from there. So why do you think there is an uptick of the word love and, and the workspace now, as opposed to maybe pre COVID or even, you know, decades earlier, Hmm. What's going on there? I think that you have enough brave souls out there putting out books and podcasts and having conversations where they're no longer skirting around the issue of love as being not suitable for a work environment. You know, you got Joel Mamby who wrote the, the book Love Works. This is the guy that led SeaWorld for a few years and Hershen uh, Entertainment before that, uh, which owns, if you're from the South, which owns uh, Dollywood, right? So he wrote the book Love Works based on the principles that come from scripture. And then he basically translated that into, um, you know, actionable business terms. And, and so that, that was a, a, a big influence on me when I read his book, I thought, wow, you know, this is a CEO of a major organization talking about love from a practical, actionable standpoint. Gosh, if he can do it, then it's like, let's open up the floodgates. And, and since then, uh, other people have come out with book, book, Steve Farber, uh, love is, love is, um, I don't have the right title. I'll come back to you, but, uh, I think it's love is damn good business. Something like that is the title. Um, and several others. Ken Blanchard puts out a lot of love related books. He's written over 60 or co-written. And, and so he always comes from the, the sort of the, the servant leadership angle. But most of his books are all about love, listening to others and uh, providing for the needs of others. 
And, uh, and so I think that love is becoming less and less of, uh, you know, uh, being seen as taboo or a risk. Uh, and those that truly understand the power of love principles, they'll jump on board. Um, those who are threatened by the idea, uh, you know, those, those bosses that lead with the iron fist, um, they're not going to be attracted to it because they're going to be threatened by it. Uh, you know, and those are hard mountains to move to begin with. I don't take clients on who are not even open to the idea of uh, care and love and empowerment of people as the business solution to your problems. I don't, I don't, because I know that they're not there yet. Mindset related, paradigm shifting related, they're not there. They haven't arrived yet. So um, I always screen out those top down type autocratic bosses um, from engaging in anything that we do related to coaching and training. Uh, because I know that they're going to have an allergic reaction and that's going to be really bad for our, our interactions, right. Moving forward. Yeah. Considering that's your core, your core, core ideas that you're mm -hmm. rolling with. So what's so threatening about it? About love? Yeah. Why do, yeah, they, why I, do they get so, why do people get so threatened by it? Well, I think because they like things their way. They like the power and they like the control. You know, when but you, I, are you saying that I can't have power and control with love? You can. Or, okay. Right. But some people. Uh, uh, yeah. How does it jeopardize that? Well, if you lead from a standpoint of love and your uh, tendency is to control others, love is going to get in the way of that. So if I hold on to all my power and don't give away my power, which is the loving thing to do right? Give away your power by helping other people lead. But if I hang on to all my, all the power and all the control, uh, love is threatening, threat, a threatening force for that kind of leadership or that kind of management. Okay. And I, I can see that I can see, I guess I can see the difference. Part of that is being the control and power being earned uh, and kind of reciprocated and kind of shared versus I'm the one with the power and the control and I'm enforcing or I'm kind of dictating power and control over everybody else. And so I think, I guess that's probably where I, I would see that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just throwing yep. it out there, spitballing. Well, you're convincing me um, even further because if I, if my tendency is to dictate uh, and not allow for other people to have voice, um, to make their own decisions, then I'm hanging on to all of the, everything goes through me, right? And, and that's a very lonely place to be <laughs> as well, right? So... So I think that love expands outwardly to include other people into making decisions and, and you assume trust, there's trust there, right? And sometimes even before trust is earned, love says, you know what? I hired you for this position. So I'm going to trust that you have the skills, expertise and talent to get the job done. So I'm going to assume positive intent and allow the freedom, allow you the freedom and autonomy before you have to prove yourself to me that you can do the job. Hey, you know, hopefully all of your interviews and selection processes up front took care of that so that you are convinced in your mind this is the right person, right? That maybe you've um, done enough assessments or having the conversations to know that this person before that person is hired and hired and signs the offer letter on the, on the X aligns his or her values with your organizational values. So there's no problems with integrity and honesty down the line. Right. So hopefully you've taken care of that to then when they come in during the onboarding process, all you're doing is the caring and the loving part. 
to make sure that they are right off the gates, engaged 150%, right? That they never feel like they're an island. How many people show up to work their first day? They don't even have a computer on their desk. Um, their phones aren't set up, you know? And, and so everybody's scrambling and, and forcing to put lunches on their calendars for the new guy, right? I mean, I speak from personal experience as a, as a whole. I mean, right off the bat, I was disengaged because they weren't prepared for me. Now, what's the loving thing to do for somebody that is coming coming on board, right? That first week, first day. It's just huddle around that person and show your culture, the culture of care. If you have a culture of care and love and uh, and you want to see people succeed, is make them feel like they belong from the moment they walk in the door. And show them this is who we are. This is how we treat each other. And especially those crucial, you know, first three to six months. Because according to research, people aren't fully convinced that they will stay in their jobs for the first six to nine months. They're still kind of like, hey, is this place really for me? So you want to take that away from people by loving them really well and caring for their needs during that crucial onboarding stage. So that, that thought never enters their mind. You know what I mean, Scott? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that when you look at that evaluation process, I think organizations think, Oh, I, I, I landed the person we got the person in, we gave them what they wanted. We negotiated. They're here. Whew, done. You know, and then, Hey, get them on, get them going. Let's wrap it up. And then we're surprised when they leave three to six months later and we just call them disloyal. We just say, ah, we just can't find loyal people anymore. We just can't find good people anymore. The job, the job pool is too small and there's not good people out there anymore, you know? And so that mentality is, well, how much are you critiquing versus really self-examining and understanding what could we do? to create more of a culture where people want to stay. Right. And why is it that we don't do that? What's your take on that? Is it that leaders, senior leaders, managers are so busy that they can't, they can't think about culture because they got expectations to meet stakeholders, you know, and you got deadlines and all that and the pressure is mounting. And so culture becomes that fuzzy, term that's like, yeah, that, you know, that's kind of icing on the cake if we have it. I think, I think for some people, sure. Like I think for some of those people that are like never really grabbed onto the whole culture wagon yeah. thing is they think of it as the softy stuff right. um, that, you know, that's a nice to have or whatever, but real numbers and real production comes from hard work. And yeah. there's also, I think, a generational shift that is happening sure. time where a lot of old school generations didn't grow up with this mentality. A lot of the owners of companies or um, those who are hitting the upper range of the workforce age never came from that mentality of love, of culture, of care, embracing whoever. And you went on to a job, you landed the job and you were there for 30 years. And I don't, it's just not that way anymore. And now those are usually the people that are calling the younger people disloyal or not hard workers or et cetera, you know, and that, that space. So I don't know, that's just thought of from my side. Yeah, no. It, and a few good thoughts to track with, gosh, uh, you know, Gen Zers, like you said, generationally, Gen Zers coming into the workforce now, early mid twenties, I think they cap out around 26 now before they rub up against the, the, the younger millennials. Um, but they, it's a, they're a different animal. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, yeah, th this is the entitled or uh, entitled generation, you know, and they used to say that about, they say that about every generation that is young. They said about, they said that about the millennials when the millennials came into the workforce 10, 15 years ago. But I think that the point is that we have to adapt to the cha changing landscape and the changing demographics um, coming into the workforce. So it's putting, putting into positions of leadership 
those that understand um, how to impact the human nature, you know, how to elevate the human spirit. And yeah, probably less boomers <laughs> are going to be in those positions because as you said, you know, they grew up just collecting a paycheck. They're 30 years in. Um, they're happy to just provide for their family and, uh, you know, clock in and clock out. But this generation. Yeah. I mean, work was a central focus of their right. lives. I mean, if there's a, uh, there's a brilliant book, um, by a friend of mine, Tim Elmore, who wrote a uh, new kind of diversity, um, that I was just reading, I was just looking at a few of the pages in here. And if you look at the, what he has, he has this this really cool chart in here. I'm showing it on uh, the video if, if you can see it, but he has this cool chart and it talks about the role of work. It has different things in here, right? Too, but the role of work for like the builders and the silent generation, the role of work was a means for a living, right? It was the people that were in scarcity. There was great depression and other things happening. So it was a means for a living. They needed it in order to live. Boomers came into it as a central uh, focus of what they were doing in life. It was kind of what gave them identity and gave them status in the community. The busters or the Gen, a Gen Xers, um, it was all about, uh, it was kind of an irritant. It was kind of this necessary evil, um, but it was about this kind of like, we were also in this rebellious phase of like sticking it to the man and trying to not, not really trust you that much and kind of being this bridge. And then with the millennials, it was a place to serve. Where can I serve? Where can I build things? And then with the Gen Zers, it's, it's a hobby. Now work has come this mentality of, I want to have fun and I want to enjoy what I'm doing and I'm going to surf until I find it. Right. And I'm also wanting that instant gratification that I've been trained in through my life, whether that is Amazon prime or whether it's, I get instant results on my tests that I just took in my class, we had to wait for scantrons to come back. Right. So there there's just this mentality shift that I think we all need to take into account, but this was really interesting. The Gen Zers with the, it's my hobby means that they don't feel a sense of loyalty to the paycheck. Sure. Everybody wants to get paid, but that care, the love, the you're a person, I value you is going to take on a huge role there. So I know this is, my show, but I'm talking a whole lot. I want you I love to share it. what your thoughts are. I love it. I mean, and, and, uh, yeah. And Dr. Dr. Tim uh, Elmore, I had him on the show too. So tell him hi for me next time you see him. I um, will. Tim's awesome. He, he sh I mean, he should know that's, that's his area of, of expertise right there. All the generational stuff. Um, and, and it's interesting that you said, I did not know about the hobbies, like work becomes work is a hobby. And that's true because, you know, during the great resignation, and I don't think we're fully out of it. Um, yeah. If you came into a work environment that did not, well, that wasn't fun and it was a pressure cooker, you're out of there, the, the, you know, the second day on the job and you're okay with, you know, driving for Uber and delivering food part-time and making that a full-time income, you know, and bouncing around until you find the right atmosphere. And I think that speaks to Gen Zers is, yeah, they are looking for care and they, they, they want to feel valued. Right. And they're going to, they're going to bounce around until they find that place. I think it's so true. Tell me, um, how did you, when did you make this shift? Because, I don't know. Was it always there? I mean, when you started your business, you started doing what you're doing. When mm -hmm. did you notice that, you know, as you're coaching, as you're consulting, as you're speaking, as you're doing other things, that this care love piece was something you wanted to hang your hat on? Yeah, it was 2003 working at a hospital and the, the environment became, became the, to, the most toxic environment I've ever worked in, um, to the point of one day stepping out of the shower, I went straight down face plant on my bathroom tile floor. What happened? Well, I had so much cortisol and adrenaline rushing through my system, says the ER doc. <laughs> two hours later, <laughs> um, that stress had caused a, 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 a literal breakdown of my back. 
And so I was on disability for two months. Uh, the first month is I, I could not, I was paralyzed. I was, could not move uh, unless you call, you know, um, crawling on your elbows, moving and sure I could move, but from the waist down, uh, no movement at all. And as I studied what happened is that when you prolong, when you're in a prolonged state of stress and fear, um, it has obvious, you know, physical consequences down the line and the health issues down the line, even some research point links it to heart disease and heart attacks. Right. And so I, I look back at those days as sort of the, the epitome of not love. Right. So you got, <laughs> so here's what happened, Scott. I leave that job. The very next job is for another hospital working for another executive. It was a complete 180. We're talking night and day. He uh, sp spoke truth into me, spent time with me, was always available, came and checked on me. So what do you need? How can I help make you better? Um, how can I be a better boss to you? And he just poured into me, just kept pouring into me and pouring into me. And I was more engaged in that role than I had ever been prior, you know, in my young corporate career at that time. Um, and so what was it about that guy? Where did that come from? What, you know, what's going on here? How is he leading this way? And I had never experienced it up to that moment. And so as I dug into the literature, I found out that, his name is Bruce. Um, he was a servant leader. And, and so I began my investigation on servant leadership as the sort of the consummate way to lead, to get the best out of people for high performance and creating a high performance organization. And, uh, you know, 15 years ago, I, I wasn't dubbed anything. Now people call me the servant leadership guy you know, and, um, and that all has to do with that, that sort of that, that before and after that, you know, the toxic top down fear based to all of a sudden I meet, I meet Bruce and I see the exact opposite in the model that we should aspire to be as a leader. And it worked for me because I experienced it and there was a whole lot of love involved and, was Bruce still large and in charge? Heck yeah, he was the boss. Of course, I had I had to meet expectations for performance and goal attainment, and yeah, all that is all part of the of the deal, right? Bruce demanded excellence in me as well, but man, did he build me up to get there? And, that's uh, cool. and yeah, so that's that's, that's cool. the story. You've had some pretty head honcho people on your show. I mean, when I look at you know, Ken Blanchard, Whitney Johnson, Marshall Goldsmith, Stephen M. R. Covey. Some of these people, um, I, I'm looking at these people going, well, these are the kind of people that are preaching this type of stuff. And probably these type of people that lead their organizations with right. love in that sense too. Is that what and you gathered book. from having them on the show? Absolutely. And write books about it and speak on it. Uh, so I, I just wanted to jump on the bandwagon. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's been a blessing um, that they have joined the conversation. Or maybe it's me that joined their conversation and they were gracious enough to pop in as a guest. So, That's yeah, wonderful. you know, and the, awesome. we, the more voices, the more voices that are shouting for the mountain. And that's why I accept invitations like yours to come on the show and talk about this is that more people need to hear about it. There's too much suffering in the world right now. There definitely is. And, uh, whether that's from, you know, culture wars, physical war, workplace battles, all kinds of stuff that's happening mm. in the, in the planet. Um, if we all just elevated with a little bit more love, whatever that is and whatever yeah. that means in the way that you lead and communicate, uh, I think it'll go a long way. Cause I think one thing that you talked about in the aspect of love is the listening aspect. You've mentioned that a couple of times and I go, 
how much can, how much more can I tell that I'm for somebody than just by listening? Mm. Now, just taking that moment to just listen and digest and just be present with somebody. How much do we really spend time? Do we spend doing that versus just immediately solving their problem? Because we either want to look competent or we want to look smart or we want to get them off our plate because we have something else to do. Yeah. Do you have time for a quick story related to that? Oh, please. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> so in, in a lot of my workshops, uh, I've even done this actually in a Zoom setting. I, I have a little exercise where I ask people to get into uh, dyads, right? Part, find a partner. And, and so the exercise goes like this. I say, all right, you have two minutes. Partner A, um, ask these three questions about partner B. And your only role after you ask questions is to listen. Do not be distracted. Don't interrupt. Just sit there and listen so that you can learn about partner B, right? And questions are around, you know, uh, relationships and, and uh, how did you meet that person and what do you like best about them? Because you want to you test that, uh, the, the listening skills. So the second half of that, is now the partner gets to hear. So I tax task partner B with, tell me, um, uh, you know what, uh, go ahead and, and uh, no partner A, I tell partner A, go ahead and, um, and kind of regurgitate back what you heard to your partner that just spoke for two minutes. Right. So partner B will say, yeah, I heard she said that I, you know, I'm married to this person and he likes to do this da, 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 da. And then I go back to partner B and says, was that accurate? So interesting array of answers there. Right. But the, the bigger lesson is that because we are constantly bombarded by interruptions because of these devices in our hands, um, some of the participants in a two minute ex listening exercise have told me this is the hardest thing I have done in a long time. Being able to just sit there, park your thoughts and focus on the other person. Two minutes, Scott. So if we can't listen for two minutes, imagine what's going on throughout the day and the week, right? When our minds are split in 10 different directions, when we're multitasking and not able to focus on one thing. Right. To be able to sit down just to listen to someone talk about their lives for two minutes is a hard thing to do these days. Wow. Yeah. You think about, you think about that. You think about your own tendencies to want to jump in and why those are there or your tendency to drift. Somebody's yeah. talking and you're just going, Ooh, what about that email? Oh my gosh. Right. I wonder if that thing came through. Oh, I went like, it's all of these things that are going out because we're so yeah. reactionary to everything that we're doing. Um, that, that attention span is, yeah. is a problem. Our, our brains have become acclimated to interruptions. So we are seeking it. We're addicted to being interrupted. How many times the day will you pull up your phone and look at it? Even though you didn't get a text, even though you didn't get a notification, you just pull up the phone to look at it, right? It's like, so we're, our, our brains have become addicted to that. Um, and even so, we have lost the ability, the human ability, <laughs> to be able to listen and be present with someone for the, all the reasons that you just stated. And sometimes... We <laughs> We're, we're distracted by our own voices, right? We're listening to someone, but we're already forming an impression or a rebuttal in our heads about, oh, this is what I'm going to say next. And then we have lost the listening part because now we're listening to ourselves. You not only have the podcast where you're talking about this, um, the Love in Action podcast, but you're also in the early stages of writing a book on this topic um, to join the ranks of all the others that have, have written books on these topics. And, and so you're hitting on these ideas for that. That's supposed to come out in 2024. Uh, what sparked that? Why, why are you, I mean, I'm assuming it's the things we've been talking about here, but 
why write another book about servant leadership and uh, love space? Where, where are you going with that? Yeah. Um, as I, uh, full disclosure, um, I come from Christian tr tradition. So in scripture, there is a, a very small passage uh, that talks about love being different things. And, uh, and so I started to look, break that down and, uh, you know, patience, kindness, and a lot of it speaks to humility and selflessness, right. Um, and advocacy and being able to believe in others. Okay. So that's what my book is about. But the reason I chose that is because I wanted to validate the science because it's a business book. I wanted to validate the science behind what faith-based communities have known for two millennia and does it cross over into the leadership realm and sure enough as i looked at the literature it does because those that lead with patience kindness humility selflessness make really good leaders and you know and we've been talking about a lot of those things already and books have been written about it but nobody's actually put it under the framework of love from that sense right borrowing if you will even though it's not a christian book borrowing from a faith-based tradition and and then and then putting it into business application so that's basically the book i love it i love that idea <laughs> that's really cool okay i can see where you're going with that i dig it okay um well you're, you do a lot of speaking. You want to continue doing that. Um, your coaching business is, is there and it's thriving and growing. Podcast is all there. Where do people get in touch with you if they want to engage with you on any of those types of platforms or inquire about any of that service? Sure. Best place to go is marcelschwantes.com. And um and then I'm on LinkedIn. I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn as well. And uh, if you type in the Google Love in, Act, Love in Action podcast, um, it'll pop up as well. So those are the best places to find me. And yeah, speaking is, is great to, uh, you know, to kind of get the word out about how to lead with love, um, whether it's on site, on a physical stage or in a virtual stage. I always uh, welcome those. Cool. Beautiful. Well, you've got a lot to share. Um, and I love this idea. I think that while we sit there and look at this idea as soft, I think the idea is that it leads to growth and opportunity for everyone in our lives and it leads to results. And that's what we're here for. We're here on this planet to get results personally, professionally in every way. And, and, I love the argument that it starts with that. So appreciate it. Mm -hmm. man. Yeah. Thanks for your time. It's been a great conversation. And you've been very gracious to, uh, you know, give me this platform. So I truly appreciate it. We started off the show talking about this word agape. And I looked it up really quick after we talked about it after the show and it says this it's this fatherly love of god for humans as well as the human reciprocal love for god and it it's this transcendent love it's the highest form of love and i think that's what we're talking about is this this extra level it's not just the the romantic love or kind of this like brotherly love you know fist bump bros let's go to the bar it's it's a higher level of love that i think is what we're talking about and the idea of servant leadership it's and this phrase caring with impact is important because i think a lot of those leaders out there that are thinking oh that love stuff mm -mm, no let's results 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 and that are afraid of the word love are are because they're not seeing that it's love with impact and that statement of, oh, I'm sorry. He said caring with impact. It's caring with impact. Caring, sure. Impact is what we are all here for and what we want. We want to create impact. And if we can figure out how to create that impact while also showing an elevated love feel and care feel, I think that we're on to something. And which is why so many of these brilliant leadership experts are writing, talking, 
and coaching about this idea. It's important. Listening. How much do we talk about listening? I love the end of that and his story about how much are we retaining? How hard is it to maintain focus in this day and age to truly listen, to be present with people while we are in the mode of work and life and busyness. And that is truly what's going to separate us from everybody else in the eyes of the people that we lead. I'm truly grateful for Marcel and the insights that he shared. I think there's some real good insights there. I think that all of you need to take away. Looking forward to his book coming out next year. If you're listening to this later on and the book's already out, lucky you, you didn't have to wait. So go check that out wherever books are sold. If you want to find out more information about me or check out the show notes where there's going to be more information and links to the things referenced in this episode, visit scottwaldron.com. And lastly, I'm asking for a little bit of love, just a little bit. So please take a moment, follow, rate the show. The algorithms like that. It helps me get the word out. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And until next time, stay unlocked.